What is the most outrageous thing you would do for $10,000 cash? That was the question that was posed by a Chicago radio station a few years back. And it attracted over 6,000 of the most extremely daft ideas imaginable. The winner, please stand up, Jay Gwaltney of Zionsville, Indiana. And what did he do? He consumed an 11 foot birch sapling, including leaves, root, and bark. Now, to show that he wasn't completely out of his mind, he donned a tuxedo and dined at a table eloquent enough for royalty. So armed with pruning shears, he munched his way through his you know, culinary delight. His only condiment, French dressing, for the massive birch leaf salad. And I would have probably gone with the Thousand Island, but we all have our preferences. It took 18 hours over a period of three days. Surprisingly, when he had finished, he complained of a stomach being upset. Like, go figure, you know. As someone has comment, commented, evidently that back was actually work worse than his bite. So the question is, what would you do for money? What would you do? Answers on a postcard and, no, never mind that bit. What would you do for money? Now, <clears throat> in a more realistic note, but probably quite disturbing, was um, a, a song by the music group ABBA, and they gave us a solution that I th suppose could work for both male and female, but the song is about females. And, you know, the song first begins with some human connection. You know the song. I work all night, I work all day to pay the bills I have to pay. Isn't it sad? And still, there never seems to be a single penny left for me. That's too bad. In my dreams, I have a plan. Now, so you're kind of waiting now for, here we go, the inspirational encouragement to kind of get what you want and get out of this predicament. Do you know what the answer was? In my dreams, I have a plan. If I got me a wealthy man, I wouldn't have to work all day. I'd fool around and have a ball. You know, but a man like that is hard to find. But I can't get him off my mind. Isn't it sad? And if he happens to be free, I bet he wouldn't fancy me. That is too bad. So, it's kind of getting desperate in the song, isn't it? She's kind of feeling down about herself. So she said... If that's not going to work out, so I must leave. I'd have to go to Las Vegas or Monaco and win a fortune in a game. My life will never be the same. So it went from manipulation to gambling. You know, it's probably not the way to go, but money, money, money must be funny in a rich man's world. Money, money, money. It's always sunny in a rich man's world. Now, the message is not blatant, as a lot of songs are. It's actually quite suggestive, isn't it? I would manipulate, I would deceive, and I would be dishonest. Essentially, I would give myself to anyone as long as they were wealthy. But what if they don't fall for it? Well, then, there's always Las Vegas, there's always the gambling. Because a rich man's world, it's funny and it's sunny and it would satisfy the desires. So that's the kind of message that's out there and what people will do for money, for security. So the choice that Jesus will lay out in our passage, very simple, isn't it? Devote yourselves to God alone and gain an eternal treasure in heaven or, here's the choice, pursue anything or everything else and watch it all turn to dust. Now that is some statement, isn't it, from Christ with the authority that he has to say that. The last couple of weeks we looked at what might be called a heavenly treasure hunt, isn't it? You know, from verse 19 to 21 that was read out. It probes us with the statement that what you truly value actually discloses what is central 
to your heart and to my heart? What is actually the true center of our lives? Now, the second analogy was about pursuing the light. That was a difficult passage, wasn't it? The eye is a lamp of the body. So it's the single eye and the evil eye are clearly revealed in what is the single devotion of the heart. Same theme, isn't it? And it came with a warning. Be on guard against deceiving yourself, self-deception, verse 23 in chapter 6. Tonight's message, the pursuit of God and the pursuit of money, they're mutually exclusive in verse 24. So we need to come to terms with the obvious. We can only serve one master. We can only satisfy one master. There may be the attempt, but it's going to be horrible and this, it'll bring no satisfaction. So Jesus says the mark of a disciple, that's what the whole Sermon on the Mount isn't about his followers. The mark of a disciple is obvious. The disciple, well, their eyes are fixed, aren't they? They're fixed on heaven, not on earth. Their spiritual vision is single. It's not divided. They serve the right master, not the wrong one. So verse 24 then, for, our, for tonight. It's the radical clarification that all people must face. You must face it as you're sitting, listening to this. It confronts us. It'll confront you now with the decision we must all make. Which one is it? You can't have both. That's what Jesus is saying. Sinclair Ferguson says this. We should notice the obvious implication of Jesus' teaching here. We were made to have a master. We weren't made to be our own. We, we were made to have a master. And Jesus then makes clear that a real dilemma that we all face in this world. No one can serve equally well two masters. Because either he'll hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and will despise the other. To one master, you will show love and devotion. To the other master, you're going to demonstrate hate and spite eventually. You see, a divided allegiance and a divided loyalty, it's just not possible in the kingdom of God. There can only be one Lord. But we live as if those two things can be balanced. The great exegete Donald Carson says this. Jesus now specifies the number one challenge to total and absolute surrender to his lordship. The King James, it's for money, for, for the King James, they call it mammon. We don't use that word too often. But it's actually the word, the, the Greek word here. And originally it meant Something in which one puts their confidence. You see, it wasn't just money. It was stuff, anything that was a security. Something in which one puts their confidence. So it begs the question, what are we, what's our real confidence? What are we, what are we trusting in? See, the, the issue is not really what you have. The issue is who or what controls you. The issue is for whom or what do you live? If you live for God, you cannot live for money. I know this sounds so radically simple, but it's amazing how much in our lives we have so much trouble with this. If you live for money, you cannot live for God. Jesus understood that we have, every one of us, everyone listening, we have a limited amount of devotion and love and service to give. And it requires of us making hard but necessary choices. The fact is, the more we love money, the experience is the less we will love God. As our obsession for money increases, our passion for God decreases. Now, this wasn't just on the level of the individual. In Jesus' day, we have all kinds of philosophies of life that are represented by all these religious organizations. The Sadducees are like our modern-day materialists and capitalists. He didn't believe in heaven. So what, what is is now, that's it. The Essians and the Quimranians, where we get our Dead Sea Scrolls, 
They were like your socialists, you know what I mean? And the zealots, I wonder what they're like. Well, they're like the imperialists. Their philosophy of money and care all failed, just like every philosophy of how money is used today outside of Christ, all fail. There's even such an emphasis in, in the church, not in the world, that if you trust Christ, he'll make you wealthy. The prosperity gospel that we talked about week before last. They all fail because all of them, they're all inconsistent with the values of this sermon that Jesus preaches. They're inconsistent and they're contradictory to the values of the kingdom of God. They're not optional for us if, they think, if we think they are. They're not. Jesus is really serious about these things. The two gods are controlling the heart. Which, which one is it that, that we're choosing to say, this is the one that really is controlling? But when we think about the different ways of thinking about, say, money and wealth, it's, it's not that Jesus doesn't care that life carries its its own vulnerabilities, and there's a, a, a myriad of them, isn't there? To varying degrees, people know what it's like to feel ex, kind of exposed to the elements. I'm not just talking about temperature, I'm talking about what it means to face all kinds of pressures. You know, to feel powerless and helpless, to know shame and, and, and despair. Have you ever been down to your last 20 bucks? We have, we know what that's like. You know, to be plunged into, into misery and depression and, and, and despondency and anguish. You know, as the song goes, you know, Jesus knows all about our troubles. He truly does know them. We look out in the world and we instinctively know that the wealthy and the needy have very different views of power. Very different perspectives on money, most certainly. You know, in the next section that Jesus is going to give us in the Sermon of the Mind, he's going to address the, all the anxieties of life. We don't have an ivory tower, Jesus. There really are rich people problems and there are poor people problems, but social justice won't alleviate, uh, alleviate what underscores all of these things. A social gospel robs the grace of God of the transforming power of a regenerated life where God brings us to life and a changed heart that comes from being regenerate from which we lay it all at the feet of Jesus. That's a totally different way of thinking, isn't it? But what happens when the God we pursue is mammon? Well, let me state the most obvious things the scripture says. Money cannot purchase what can only be received as a gift. And what is that? Contentment. Contentment. I'm going to have a few quotes by A.W. Tozer. I've quoted these before. They're just so rich. He says, The roots of our heart in this modern day have grown down into things, and we dare not pull up the rootlets, rootless, lest we die. Things have become necessary to us, a development never originally intended. God's gifts now take the place of God. And the whole course of nature is upset by the monstrous sub substitution. So money can't buy what can only be received as a gift, can't buy contentment. But the love of money produces something else. It produces that internal battleground that internal conflict that's why Luke 16 will say just like here you cannot you cannot this is this is impossible you can't serve two masters Tozer continues with this he said that within the heart things have taken over in, in practice men have now by nature no peace within the hearts in their hearts for God is crowned no longer there but in the moral dusk, stubborn and aggressive usurpers, they fight among themselves for first place on the throne. Isn't that quite the image, isn't it? In the moral dusk, stubborn and aggressive usurpers fight among themselves for first place in the heart. The love of money produces 
conflict internally. You know what that's about, don't you? The love of money also produces an external conflict. Let's just listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy. He says this in verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmless desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So, where, where, when there is discontentment in the heart, in the thought life, it results in personal internal destruction of the battle that's going on. Or in many cases, the destruction of relationships over money. They say it's one of the number one reasons why married couples fall apart. Money, money is a main issue. But sometimes even people get so despairing they'll take their own lives. Or they'll kill for money. How crazy is that when you think about it? To kill someone, to take their lives for money. It's, it's for no reason... That in the business world, you know, they call it dog eat dog. See, the Apostle Paul, he states that those who desire, those who want to get rich, literally, they have as their one desire, one desire to be rich, they fall into four things. Number one, they fall into a temptation. Temptations. Temptations, when they want to get rich. So they base their way of life and their process of making decisions on something we know is irrational, it's dumb, and it's destructive, and it may be eternally so. It's a gamble, isn't it? It's a risk. And all the promises that life tempts us with, you know, that's going to deliver us the joy we crave, but it can't. That's what Jesus is saying. Money is just a cruel master. Secondly, they fall into a trap. It's like that snare to a small animal. You won't win if money is your God. The jaws come down and you're going to be caught. We all will be caught in a labyrinth of a moral quag quagmire. It's like walking. Literally what quagmire means is you walk across a soft, a soft boggy area of land and it just gives way underneath your feet. That's what the love of money does. Third thing, it leads to senseless and harmful desires, the love of money. In other words, the desire to have riches as God opens up to all kinds of sin. If God is like your is riches to you, it opens up all kinds of sins, like greed and envy and covetousness. You know, they don't originate or remain in a vacuum. Envy is actually suicide, not murder, because it's, it's a self-inflicted wound, isn't it? Senseless and harmful desires, Paul says. And lastly, they fall into ruin and destruction. A lot of falling going on, isn't there? They pierce themselves, in another translation, with many griefs. Now, you'd think we'd be smart enough just by those verses, but amazingly, we're not. Paul concludes that many who get snared by the craving for money, they wander away from the faith. Isn't that interesting? Did you notice? It's not some hard, sharp turn. It's a journey. They wander away, you know, for miles and miles and step by step. They may still come to church. They may still do religious things. But they wander away from the faith. I love reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer and he states this, earthly goods are given to us to be used, not collected, used in the wilderness as an example. God gave Israel manna every day. You know the passage. And they had no need to worry about food and drink. Indeed, if they just kept, if they kept any of the manna over till the next day, it all went rotten, wasn't it? It all went bad. That's a great analogy. If we store up things as a store up things as a permanent possession, that's the issue, isn't it? He spoils not only the gift of God, that person also spoils his own life as well. 
For he sets his heart on the accumulation of wealth and he makes it a barrier between himself and God. Hoarding is not just a bad habit, it's idolatry. It may reveal psychological issues and you know, issues of real concern, mental issues, but behind the whole thing, hoarding is idolatry. Why? Because it becomes to our hearts the kind of treasure that we really trust in. We place our security in. We believe that we can really exhale and relax in the comfort that we have, confidence that it's going to provide for us, we're going to be fine. But in it all, it becomes actually, in practice, our God. Of course, everyone is thinking right now, oh, can hold on, what's too much then? What's too little? What's careless and what's, what's weakness? And Jesus actually won't answer. Why? Because this message is no different than all the other ones in the Sermon on the Mind. Because freedom and bondage are conditions of the heart. It all depends on where our treasure is. Isn't that right? For there will be the heart. So, oh, what bondage Jesus talks about on one side. But oh, what freedom on the other. Do you get a sense that Jesus is talking about anything different? All masters want total allegiance. The earthly heart has desires natural to its condition. It's earthly, isn't it? And what does it seek? Glory. We might call it, in our language, reputation or recognition. You know, to be praised and to be honored by people. We want wealth, we want power, we want security, we want influence. These are natural to the heart that's, listen, turned in on itself. But the heart won't just turn in on itself. It turns to something that the heart determines will promise those things. And of course, the grand delusion is that money won't. But at that moment, we think it does. Like for a while, like for a season, maybe even for a prolonged period. But money was never intended to be a source that can be trusted ever. For as soon as those things dissolve, where moth and rust destroy, they're not the only things that crumble. Sometimes the person does too, and the ones he has relationship with. Now, it might seem that this is just overly negative, but if, if you don't know already the heart of Christ, you know that really what he's talking about is freedom. The freedom that really comes from serving him. If you're not convinced already, well then this message isn't going to do it either. Because quite clearly, if you take this separation of money on one side and you know, a, a loyalty and allegiance to God himself. It's a number of things that happen. Freedom from the pointless, from a pointlessly destructive lifestyle. I love this sermon because it's all about living, isn't it? It's, it's, most certainly it's resting on a great theology of the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God. Heaven's, you know, you know heaven's, uh, arena be experienced in some measure here on earth it's quite beautiful and wonderful it's incredibly beautiful and so there's a freedom from a dis pointlessly destructive lifestyle you hear now in these days of COVID how despairing people are marriages breaking down people hurting themselves level of suicide attempts and up considerably domestic violence. Not just at home, but also outside. You see, in Christ, when God is Lord, that's where the character gets manufactured. Secondly, it's freedom from being driven by circumstances. I had a good friend of mine back in Ireland who got this bug of the stock markets. I'm not talking against stock markets if you can, or investment. But to him, it was all about just the easy money, the motive behind it. He just never stopped talking about it. I'm thinking it'd be great as an evangelist for the stock market. But it didn't cure his anxiety. It actually controlled him. Now, stock markets may not be your circumstances, 
But if your life is single and it's the service of God and not money, it's unbelievable what that does to the heart when it's true. Freedom from pointlessly destructive lifestyles, freedom from being driven by circumstances, freedom from just even the control of routine. We're actually going to talk about that next week, you know, but eating and drinking and, you know, what am I going to put on? And it's just like the drudgery of necessities. Um, and, and I'm thinking, you know, I grew up in a huge family, and I, that's all I can remember. It's just constant routines, and my life was disappearing, and I was a, a number, you know, in a, in a vast number of children in my family, and you can kind of feel that that's all life was. But when God is being served, that is an unbelievable freedom. We know exactly what he wants us to do in that day. We just have to ask him, be in his word, he'll tell us. Fourthly, it's freedom being, from being enslaved to compromise. Did you see what Jesus said here? Like if you hold to one of these, you're going to despise the other. It's no wonder that the Gentiles eagerly sought out, you know, these things. It's a difficult thing to talk about, isn't it, in some ways? Because it really does throw us in the practical area that says, is my faith in Christ real? Or is actually my faith in practically in something else? Freedom from being enslaved to compromise. Freedom from being enslaved to people. There are all kinds of evil. <laughs> it normally brings bondage to, to something. I don't know about you, but as you can see, I'm a fashion guru. And therefore, you know what I mean? I'm enslaved to my fashion as... The big talk around here is that I constantly wear the same black jacket against a black background. I have another colour, but I'm in rebellion right now and I refuse to wear it. But if fashion controls you, you pre prepare your life for a stockpiling of clothing or jewellery or whatever it is. Why? Because it just changes every two minutes and you're going to need to have it. it it's kind of, in, it just enslaves you, doesn't it? But it can be anything else. It can be that a shiny vehicle. It can be a clean house. It can be the people that you're, you're afraid of what you're going to say to. Or are you afraid that you're going to lose your reputation in front of? Imagine what it would be like to be truly free. Where you're enslaved to God alone and not to anyone else. It's not an incredible promise. An incredible life to be free. And lastly, of course... The ultimate freedom is actually serving God. Luke 16 simply says these two things, and I want us to focus on this. This ultimate freedom, this serving God, is that we, we will love him and we will be devoted to him. And I think the more a person grows into serving God as the Lord of our lives, especially with his mercy and his grace flowing over our lives through what Christ has done, of course, our love for God is going to grow out of his love for us. And of course, we're going to be devoted to one because we know what happens is that if we're not, guess what happens? You know, we'll end up either despising money those as a security or we'll be despising God. I'm always amazed by this maxim. It's not an absolute truth. It's just generally true. When people want to do whatever they want to do, the first thing they do, especially from a faith background, get rid of God. Get rid of the authority of Scripture. Don't be in it. Don't stay. And then you'll just about believe anything else. You'll end up despising God. You won't use that language, maybe. Get rid of God first. Get rid of the truth first. And you'll serve anything. You cannot serve God and wealth. Because the kind of freedom we're talking about, it's born in love, not misery. It's born of, in grace and in, and in mercy. It's born in promises that are eternal. It's, it's born in a promise where Jesus says, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. See, what we pursue will define us in our lives. Isn't that why Jesus says, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. Seek Christ first. Seek his kingdom first. Seek his will. Seek his pleasure. Do you know what he rests all of that on? Jesus' bottom line is a very simple thing. He simply says in all of this, you can absolutely trust me. 
at the at the end of the game that's that's exactly the the, the whole of uh, of Christ's discussion you say you can absolutely trust me I'm worthy to be trusted let's bow and let's pray Heavenly Father, I pray that your spirit would convince us that we're not talking about morality or just moral principles. We are talking about the freedom that comes from knowing you. When you capture our hearts by the incredible grace of the cross, where your wrath is turned away from us, and we receive your mercy and grace and we have forgiveness and a new righteousness that we can't earn that we can stand before you in Christ. And it's just such a wonder. It's such an amazing way to think and feel and live and pursue. We won't, can't help ourselves from worshipping you. We can't help ourselves from living it out. We just can't help ourselves from living it out into a lost world. And I pray, Father, we would never get bogged down. And it's simply just a matter of our bank accounts and our trust in them. But Jesus, you have told us the seriousness of this. And so we're not going to let this message pass by us. We're going to search our own souls before you, Lord. And we may not say that we're trusting in money. But we know the heart is deceitful. And I pray, Father, just that as the gospel continues to work its grace in us, that we would recognize the insidious nature of what wealth can do. Help us to be free. Help us to understand that everything you give, you've given to us is a gift to be used for your glory, not hoarded, not collected. Thank you for the immeasurable riches that are in Christ. And we praise you for him. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And